up witches i'm your host emma and you're listening to the true crime witch podcast where i'll discuss everything murderous mysterious and downright macabre Hello everyone, I'm your host Emma and welcome to the True Crime Witch podcast. So the first episode of my podcast is actually going to be covering the disappearance of Claudia Lawrence who went missing 10 years ago to this month in 2009. So growing up, especially when I, because I grew up in Sheffield, um, I saw a lot of coverage about this case on the news. I always saw her dad and her mom, um, Peter and Joan. You know, they were always on, like, local, um, regional news, you know, appealing for any information, any updates, you know, witnesses to come forward, really anything. And for so many years, both of her parents never, ever gave up. But enough of the rambling, let's get into what really matters. Claudia Elizabeth Lawrence was born on the 27th of February 1974 in Malton, North Yorkshire, to Peter and Joan Lawrence. At the time of her disappearance, Claudia was working as a chef at the University of York. Claudia was just 35 years old when she went missing. So York is an incredibly beautiful city and if you ever get the chance to visit there, you absolutely should. York really strikes me as the kind of place where re- like much crime doesn't really happen. Even when I've been there as, as a kid or you know as an adult, as a tourist, it just feels like murders, serious crimes, disappearances would never really happen. Even when me and my fiance went together on holiday at, at night, there was just no one around. And maybe that's just a city centre thing. Maybe it's not a buzzing city centre like we're used to in Manchester. But honestly, just it's just so peaceful. There was no one on the roads. You know, the the clubs and the bars were very quiet and tame compared to what we're used to. So it honestly just feels like York really isn't the place for something like this to happen. But then again, that's not to say that, you know, cities don't have their bad spots or they don't have occasional crimes. It just feels like a crime of this nature just doesn't fit in here at all. Claudia was last seen near her home in Melrose Gate, York on the 18th of March 2009. She had returned from her job as a chef at the University of York's Goodrick College in the Roger Kirk Centre. That evening she made contact with her parents via her phone. So Claudia was completely obsessed with her phone. She spent every spare minute she could texting or using her phone. She pretty much never let the battery die and was always, you know, texting back and forth with people. So people always knew where she was and you have to remember that 2009 was the time before we had smartphones you know it's not like it is now where we have twitter and facebook and instagram and everything at our disposal basically all you could really do on your phone in 2009 was take pictures and put stupid filters on them or or text people you know i some i mean they had internet access i mean i'm going back to like having a blackberry and bbm and stuff like that but i really don't think that claudia's phone was even capable of getting onto the internet so her mother joan describes how she spoke to claudia on the phone at around 8 and 8 30 between those times that evening they made plans together to spend the upcoming mother's day together which was actually on sunday the 27th of 22nd sorry of march in 2009 Joan also said that her and Claudia were watching the same TV show as she could hear it in the background and the pair were discussing it together. I can't find any details of what this show was. I'm guessing maybe it was soaps or watching a documentary on BBC or or something like that, but I don't actually have details of what they were watching. And sadly, little did Joan Lawrence know that this would be the last time that she would ever get to speak to her daughter, Claudia. So on the evening of the 18th of March 2009, Claudia sent a text to a friend at 8.23pm which corroborates with the fact that she was on the phone with her mum between 8 and 8.30, approximate rough times. And the last text that was received 
into her phone was at 9.12pm from a number in Cyprus. So, according to the police investigation, the last text that Claudia received on her phone was actually never opened by Claudia. This could be because Claudia went to bed at around 9pm when she had an early morning shift, so she had to be out of the house for 5am for a 6am shift. But during the investigation, as you will see as this case progresses, there is evidence to suggest that Claudia got up that morning got ready for work, you know, got dressed, brushed her teeth, ate breakfast, and then left the house. So this kind of strikes me as odd that this was never opened. Maybe Claudia sort of left it unopened and thought, okay, it's unopened, I can go back to it later, you know, when I'm on my, my break, or, you know, I have chance, you know, so she didn't forget that someone had texted her, and obviously she didn't want to wake someone at four or five in the morning, even though there was probably like an hour, two hours time difference between Cyprus and here in the UK. Um, probably she didn't want to wake someone up with a text at like five in the morning which is actually pretty considerate and it's also well known that Claudia often holidayed in Cyprus even as far to make friends with the local bartenders she returned each year to see them they kind of really became close-knit and very friendly and obviously Claudia and all the friends in Cyprus kept in regular contact via text and possibly social media However, quite a few articles that I've read from newspapers suggest that Claudia wasn't on social media. Um, I believe it's also reported by her father, Peter, on the website findclaudia.co.uk that Claudia wasn't active on social media, which I find a little bit strange because in 2009 she was 35, you know, everyone was on social media, you know, even like, I want to say MySpace, but <laughs> probably wasn't a thing then. Um, pretty much everyone had Facebook, you know, emails, stuff like that, you know, to keep in contact with friends. So kind of strikes me as odd that a woman, well, Claudia was 35, so... But if she wasn't on social media, maybe that just wasn't her thing. It's also important to notice that when Claudia disappeared, she had actually left her passport and bank cards at home. So it's actually not un unusual that she would you know, not need to take a passport anywhere with her because why do you need your passport for work? And she probably also wouldn't have needed her bank card for work either. You've got to remember that 2009 is a time where most places still accept cash, you know, contactless isn't even a thing. Um, you know, she probably wouldn't have needed to buy food at work because obviously she works as a chef, so I'm guessing that maybe as part of her job she got food there, you know unless she was planning to go shopping or something like that or maybe to the pub after a shift I really don't see why she would have needed a bank card or a substantial amount of cash although it is important that we have this fact established that she did take her work bag which obviously probably had a chef whites in other stuff like that and she did take her hair straighteners now I found this through reddit that she took her hair straighteners and apparently this was pretty common for Claudia and I'm guessing that there are a lot of other women out there who this is probably pretty common for as well. Personally I don't even use straighteners so I wouldn't take them but I did know girls at school who would take their straighteners to school. There are people at work who, who bring stuff like that maybe if they're going out after or I guess working in a kitchen. It's pretty humid, pretty hot, your hair's gonna get pretty frizzy so I can understand why she would want to take her straighteners to work with her. So going back to the point about Claudia not taking her passport or a bank card, um, there are a couple of theories surrounding the fact that Claudia obviously left of her own volition and ran away to start a new life, but Claudia could have, tra have travelled around the UK using cash and to get into Scotland, Ireland and Wales, you don't need a passport obviously, and to get into Northern Ireland all you need is proof of being a UK citizen. So. That's usually done with a driving license, which I assume Claudia, like most people, probably kept this in her purse. I know my provisional license is in my purse. I know some people keep it in the glove box of their car, or they keep it in the pocket, or something like that. But I guess she she could have. But I don't see why you would leave your bank card, your passport at home, especially when we look at some of the later theories that suggest that Claudia left to Cyprus. 
I don't understand how she could have gained entry to Cyprus without a passport or a bank card. It just seems like a very odd conclusion to me. So also on the morning of the 19th of March 2009, Claudia's car was still at her house and she had in fact walked to work that morning. So we know that Claudia had gotten up, had breakfast, brushed her teeth and she walked to work because obviously her work bag was missing, her hair straighteners were missing. I think it's pretty much a reported fact by North Yorkshire Police as well and obviously the horrible disgusting tabloid newspapers that um, Claudia had like left a toothbrush out, there's a breakfast bowl in the kitchen sink so obviously she, I'm guessing she must have left it for when she got home. So it seems odd that she would choose to disappear like I said without taking a car, her passport, her bank card and most importantly her phone charger. As someone who was obsessed with her phone as Claudia, it was known that she wouldn't let her phone just die out like that. She would take her phone charger to work, you know, she would always make sure that she had enough charge on her phone that so she could text people and be in constant communication. So at the time of her disappearance, Claudia's green-blue Vauxhall Astra Corsa was being repaired at a local garage, meaning that she would have had to walk to work explaining why she would have left her house at 5 a.m. sort of instead of leaving at half five. She had to take Hull Road which led through a concealed area and across a bridge. So Claudia's walk would have taken her around 30 minutes from her home in Melrose Gate to the University in York where she worked. So it's actually unclear whether Claudia was reported missing on the 19th of March 2009 when she didn't show up for work or on the 20th of March by her dad Peter. Um, Peter says that he's the one who reported her missing on the 20th after you know quite a few friends didn't get texts back from Claudia and that her co-workers confirmed that she wasn't in work and you know no one was able to get hold of her and it wasn't like her to not show up for a shift you know if she was ill or something had come up she she would have let someone know. Um, but I have read several reports, again, newspapers, speculation, false false things, Reddit, you know. Um, there are reports that she was reported missing by her work on the 19th of March. So there's some discrepancies there, but I'm working with the theory that she was reported missing on the 20th of March because this is what was listed by North Yorkshire Police so I'm guessing they're the ones who know because they received the official report. So back to the 19th of March, curiously Claudia's phone was switched off at 10 minutes past 12 p.m. so dinner time. Police have been unable to confirm if it was switched off manually or whether it had run out of battery. Again the first case seems more likely as by all accounts Claudia was obsessed with her phone and she would have never let it run out of battery if her battery was running low before she left the house for work. She would have taken a charger with her so she could leave it on charge while she worked. So, curiously, North Yorkshire Police actually changed Claudia's case from a missing persons case to a suspected murder case despite there being little evidence to back this up. And this was within a matter of hours of Claudia being officially reported missing, that they changed from missing person to suspected murder. Why? There is no evidence, the forensic investigation wouldn't have even been finished at this point. I'm going with that they changed from missing person to suspected murder within around six hours of her disappearance. So that's not an awful lot of time for a forensic investigation to be completed. I myself, I'm a forensic science and criminology graduate and I've done numerous crime scene, like fake crime scene investigation um, studies, not studies, exams where you know you go into a fake flat and have to investigate everything and we had eight hours to do that and I can tell you that eight hours is not an awful long amount of time to, to gather any evidence. It's it's painstaking and it's intense but for all the right reasons it's intense because you have to concentrate so that you don't miss anything vital 
So going back to North Yorkshire Police, they claim that Claudia had a secret life that her family knew nothing about and that she was involved in many complicated relationships, mainly with married men and that these married men were having affairs with Claudia. Um, there were also some rumours that she was having sort of affairs and relationships with people in Cyprus. However, her dad, Peter Lawrence, has strongly denied these claims made by North Yorkshire Police on the BBC Today programme that was aired on the 4th of June 2009. I guess if these claims are not factual, that actually must be pretty hurtful for her own family to hear. And her own family have even sort of suggested that the police digging so far into Claudia's private life clouded their investigation and it also did a lot to cloud the judgment of people around Claudia so sort of you know in the area where she lived and and stuff like that she was no longer being seen as a victim which no matter if she had relationships and affairs with married men it's still extremely important to realize and remember that this is a missing person and they deserve to be found safe and well or if in the worst possible case scenario that Claudia and her family deserve justice and they are a victim in this and now that doesn't excuse the fact that Claudia you know may or may not have been having affairs with married men you know splitting you know families up or causing divorces but it's extremely important to remember that this this is about a missing person it's not about their private life which I guess tabloid newspapers and you know horrible news websites whatever love to run with they love to dig up the dirt and sell as many newspapers or get as many clicks as possible but I think in the end we all have to remember that Claudia is a missing person and if something has happened to her then she's a victim too. So again I'm gonna go back to North Yorkshire Police changing a case from missing to murder. Um, so this was actually changed from missing to suspected murder and then to like actual murder in six weeks but they had no evidence that Claudia had been murdered or that she was dead they had no body like no solid forensic lead and they pretty much refused to sort of comment on why they thought she was dead they sort of just said like oh yeah well we're taking this as a suspected or sorry we're taking this as a murder inquiry which is is great it's nice to see that the investigation had been escalated and that this was take, being taken seriously and the manpower was being on board but i really feel like they should have at least informed the family and the public as to any possible leads or like you know we think this or that it could have maybe helped trigger some sort of memories or helped bring in new leads but North Yorkshire Police seem to be pretty quiet on this one. So Crime Stoppers which is a popular television show in the UK if you're from the UK you probably have seen Crime Stoppers a million times um, they, they air cases that you know happen around around the UK and appeal for information. They show video clips and discuss cases, discuss um, Scotland, maybe Scotland Yard's most wanted criminals and stuff like that. They also sometimes have happy news where criminals have been caught or maybe a missing person has been found, you know, safe and well. So Crime Stoppers in 2009, I believe it was actually offered a £10,000 reward for information that would lead to an arrest of a suspect or lead to Claudia. This reward money how has, has however been since withdrawn which I find quite strange even though this is 10 years on now in 2019 if you're listening in, in the future or whatever but I find it strange that they would withdraw the £10,000 because Without naming specific cases, there are a lot of cases in the UK that get continual press coverage and funding, but it just seems like in this case it was just sort of, oh, well, we've not made major breakthrough, so, you know, we're gonna just withdraw. So, anyway, North Yorkshire Police had actually received around 1,200 tips with information, and again, no further comments were made, 
by North Yorkshire Police regarding these. And 1,200 tips is an intensely large amount of information to follow up on. Whether that was, you know, tips that maybe didn't lead to anything or people, you know, suspected sightings that really weren't, you know, sightings or people getting confused. But that is still a lot of information that North Yorkshire Police refused to comment on, which I find very strange. So, September of 2009, North Yorkshire Police announced that their search would be expanded into Cyprus as the last message Claudia received at 9 12 so 12 minutes past 9 on the 18th of march was from a cypriot number and like i said she had known many different people on the island and when the police well north yorkshire police got to cyprus witnesses in cyprus seemed less than happy to cooperate according to north yorkshire police detective superintendent ray galloway and for me at least it seems highly unlikely that claudia would have made it to Cyprus without a passport unless she was using fake identity but again I feel like at least from where I lived her case was pretty well publicized and that if she was at the airport maybe someone would have recognized her maybe someone at border control would have stopped her and been like wait aren't you missing etc etc I just feel like it's a pretty far-flung theory to you know think that Claudia just all of a sudden ran away but again it's it's possible we can't rule anything out so another interesting fact or clue is that when the crime scene investigation were searching Claudia's house they found brown hair dye like a box hair dye in Claudia's bathroom bin so Claudia did have blonde hair or like sort of blondy brownie hair with highlights in for a few years but it started to go back to a natural brown before her disappearance so this sort of explains the box dye that was found in her house if you've ever had blonde hair or know anyone that has blonde hair especially sort of back in the day not back in the day that's 2009 it's not that long ago but back in 2009 maybe hair dyes and you know hairdressers and everything weren't what they are now so it wasn't uncommon that if you put like a light brown on top of a blonde it would fade super quickly or maybe she had roots coming in but anyway doesn't matter that explains why she had brown hair dye in her home um quite a few people have suggested that oh she had a box of hair dye because you know she wanted to change her identity and change how she looked and and run away but i feel like she would have done something a little bit more drastic to change herself than go back to a natural hair colour. If she didn't want to be found by people who knew her, why go back to brown, which is your natural hair colour? Why not go super dark or super light? So, because Claudia had actually gone back to brown hair, her mother, Joan, was outraged, quite naturally, you'll see why she was outraged, when North Yorkshire Police actually issued Claudia's missing poster featuring her with blonde hair. So this was a huge error by North Yorkshire Police and this is extremely misleading to the public. This could have led to, you know, missed tips, um, missed possible sightings by people. They were probably looking for a woman in her mid-thirties with blonde hair when she actually had brown hair. I just think that's a really, really basic error for North Yorkshire Police to make. Um, I don't understand how maybe they got hold of photos without asking the family but again if you're going to publish something such as a missing poster you should probably speak to the family about you know what that person looked like. So in March 2010 North Yorkshire Police conducted search searches in Heslington York due to a tip that had finally come in after a year of waiting. Sadly this search came to nothing. And also, starting from 2010, an anonymous person had actually been laying wreaths, so like Christmas wreaths of like flowers and stuff like that, on Claudia's door each Christmas since her disappearance, most likely from, I feel like maybe it could have been from guilt or it could have just been, you know, an anonymous person in the community letting Claudia and her family know that her disappearance 
you know, that she wasn't forgotten about and like a sign of respect and that they cared. But obviously to Peter and Joan Lawrence, this was extremely distressing and Peter actually made a like live public uh, press conference asking the person to stop playing the reefs. I can completely understand where he's coming from. I completely understand if this was just, you know, an innocent person wanting to pay their respects and say to the family, look, you know, we're not giving up his you know like a nice gesture but I can also understand from her family's side that this would be quite distressing because it, it feels like maybe a taunt from the person who had something to do with her disappearance so a huge dis uh, sorry a huge break in Claudia's case came in 2013 when North Yorkshire police opened a major crime unit that would be taking on cult cases so in July of 2013 the major crime unit announced that by October 2013 they would be investigating the case of Claudia Lawrence and another case from 1997 in Harrogate which is also in North Yorkshire. I'm not too sure how far apart Harrogate and York are but you know they're, they're both in North Yorkshire if you don't know the geography of Yorkshire, Sheffield, Doncaster, Rotherham, Barnsley, they're all in the south and then you've got York and Harrogate in the north and sort of like, oh, I don't know, but you know, Google Maps. <laughs> so thanks to the major crime unit, a new forensic search was conducted on Claudia's home using, you know, brand new and updated forensic techniques, which I'm really passionate about. I love when I get to read about all of the new techniques coming to the forefront and how they can really, really solve cases like Claudia's. So they found new fingerprints and male DNA from a cigarette end found in her car. So, and they also worked on her phone, which showed activity in the Acom area before being turned off at 10 minutes past 12 on the 19th of March, 2009, which actually suggests that Claudia wasn't near her work at the University of York. Um, I'm not too sure where the Acom area is, but I don't believe that the University of York and Acom are in the same place. Maybe it's possible she went there on a lunch break, but again, she didn't show up for work on the 19th, so I'm confused about that part. So going back to the fingerprint and the male DNA from the cigarette end, in 2009, North Yorkshire Police put out an appeal asking any witnesses to come forward after a man who was described as a left-hand smoker was seen with a woman on Mer Melrose Gate Bridge at 25 minutes to 6 on Thursday the, thir the 19th of March 2009. So this is important as this bridge was actually the same bridge that Claudia would have walked over on her path to work, you know, obviously had her car not been in for repair. So this feels like it could be a pretty solid lead. If Claudia was seen with a man, it's very possible that it was an innocent encounter. Maybe she was walking to work with someone, you know, to feel safe. Maybe it was a friend that she saw on passing. Or maybe this man and woman on Melrose Gate Bridge is completely unrelated to Claudia's case. I personally think it is related because who would be walking on a bridge in New York at 25 to 6? in the morning you know if it's not Claudia and someone else I just feel like that's way too early for random people to be out but you know I don't know other people's schedules and stuff like that so another possible lead came in when a man and a woman were seen arguing by a car outside the University of York at 10 minutes past 6 in the morning now Claudia started her shift at 6 a.m. so it is possible that this was Claudia and that she was running late for work and having an argument with someone. So if the two incidents connected, it's possible that the man and woman seen on Melrose Gate Bridge, and sorry, more importantly, the man, could have followed Claudia to work, continued to argue on the way to work, which made Claudia late for work, hence the sighting of the man and the woman arguing outside the University of York at 10 minutes past six. So let's fast forward a few years to March 19th, 2014, when Crime Watch 
aired an appeal which showed CCTV footage of a silver Ford Focus driving along the road where Claudia lived before literally suddenly breaking as it approaches Claudia's house. Um, I will try and find the YouTube clip of this and link it to my website truecrimewitch.co.uk. I will be posting, you know, everything I've talked about here. I've got a document that I'll be posting. Um, I'll try and get a few video links to like the Crime Watch episodes, um, a couple of news links, the link to the official case file for Claudia on North Yorkshire Police's website. Um, I'll also be linking the uh, findclaudia.co.uk website, which I believe was made by um, her mum and dad, Joan and Peter. So that's really important. That's got a lot of information on there about the disappearance, you know, first hand from her family. So a year later, in 2015, on March 23rd, police announced that they had arrested a male in his 50s in connection with Claudia's murder. However, by the 8th of March 2016, this was thrown out by the courts due to lack of evidence. North Yorkshire Police have commented, finally about something, that there are similarities between the cases of Melanie Hall and Joanna Yates and Claudia Lawrence. Um, so Melanie Hall and Joanna Yates both disappeared in 1996, the year I was born, and 2010 respectively. So they were also young blonde British women, but there's not, you know, there's no evidence that connects the three cases. It's merely a coincidence that three blonde British women happened to go missing within X amount of years, you know, between between each other. So in 2010, a woman's body was found on Christmas Day, and the Lawrence family naturally wondered whether they finally had had the answers that they were searching for. Um, unfortunately for Claudia's family, the body was, was not Claudia. The body was actually identified as the missing Joanna Yates, which is extremely sad for Joanna and her family. I actually remember the Joanna Yates case as well, you know, growing up. So maybe that's a case I'll get into for the future. So, at the time of her disappearance, Claudia was described as white, five foot six, slim build with brown hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a t-shirt, a white t-shirt, blue jeans and trainers. If Claudia Lawrence was alive today, she would be 45 years old. So as of 2019, Claudia Lawrence is still missing and her family deserve answers. And if Claudia was murdered, she deserves justice. If you have information, please contact North Yorkshire Police on 101 or you can contact Crime Stoppers anonymously. As of the airing of this podcast, it's been 10 years, pretty much almost to the day, depending on the day that this podcast is published. Um, it will have been 10 years since Claudia disappeared and there are little to no leads in, in what happened to her or at least little to no leads in what North Yorkshire police are willing to talk about. There are a few possible leads in the form of convicted killers and other suspects and serial killers and all sorts of this but they're not something that I wanted to discuss too in depth because nothing solid or conclusive has ever been brought forward or brought to court so I think it's sort of unfair to discuss those possible theories about oh it was this serial killer or it was this person um until solid evidence comes out and we can say yes it was this person or no they didn't do it i think it's a very slippery slope going down the the possible serial killer route because there's just so much that we don't know in this case so until new forensic evidence or techniques or testing methods come out or someone breaks their 10 year vow of silence, it's pretty unlikely we'll ever know what happened to Claudia, which to me is absolutely heartbreaking. I know that her parents, Peter and Joan, have pretty much never stopped campaigning and, you know, tirelessly putting Claudia's face and her case out there and her family are true 
activists and like faces of missing people they really really do so much for missing you know missing persons cases i know that there's a missing persons case that's active right now and peter lawrence actually reached out to the family of the missing person to offer them comfort and support and you know advice and in an extremely difficult time and I can that really speaks to what kind of person Peter Lawrence is the fact that he's never given up hope for finding Claudia he he campaigns tirelessly and the fact that he's willing to reach out to another family so so desperate and so heartbroken to offer support you know he hasn't just shut down he, he wants to help so I think that um, Peter and Joan Lawrence are true advocates for missing people and I know that Peter and, and Joan as well um, had so many talks in in Parliament and talks on the news and on the radio and TV and just so much advocacy work for missing people and trying to get new laws brought in and trying to get you know just all of these things passed through Parliament so that these cases don't have to happen to anyone else so I think that is a real testament to the Lawrence family as people that hold really really strong values and for Claudia and her family's sake I really hope that there are some answers soon perhaps not the answers that her parents want although I did read um, on a news publication but I'm not sure how much credibility I should take from this new source that Claudia's dad Peter um, he has pretty much little to no hope of finding her alive anymore he sort of just wants and sort of expects to find her body which I think is very sad but I think he's being realistic at this point so I hope for her family's and friends sake that they can get the justice and peace that they deserve so that was episode one of the true crime witch podcast thank you for listening if you want to keep up with me and my crazy ramblings on social media you can find me on twitter just at true crime witch um i post a lot of rubbish you know crazy tweets pictures of cats dogs and everything in between if there's a case that you would like me to talk about drop me a dm on twitter um you can also follow me on instagram but I don't really use Instagram, I don't don't really understand, I'm kind of an old lady. So thanks for listening, stay spooky and most importantly, stay safe.